بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Okay, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. I start in the name of God, the most beneficent and the most merciful, and welcome and greet all of you with the Islamic greeting of peace. Assalamu alaikum. That means peace of God be upon each single one of you. And some of you from the Christian faith, you'll be surprised and amazed to find out that we Muslims, we follow all the prophets of God, especially Prophet Jesus and the prophets mentioned also in the Old and the New Testament. So Jesus, who we respect, and the Quran mentions him more than 25 times, he used to greet his disciples with the greeting of peace, peace be upon you. You know, we had so many applauses for the volunteers, for the two you know, sisters who recited the Quran. I would say on behalf of all the Muslims, we need to give a big round of applause to all the guests who came over here, right? Why not? Why? Very good. In 2017, I took my family to Jerusalem just to see the historical sites up there. I was in Palestine and I was uh, coming back home and just to grab some souvenirs from one of the shops. So one of the Muslim ladies wearing the hijab, she asked me the question, okay, Sabil, where are you from? She knew that I'm from the US, but she wants to know like specific city. When I mentioned to her that I'm from uh, Chicago, right? <laughs> When I mentioned Chicago, she became really concerned. And she said, are you okay? Is your family okay? We always see all of this gun violence in Chicago, right? And I was thinking, you know, Chicago is a wonderful city. Yes, there is a good and bad apples in any faith, any followers, any city, any culture. But if the media only shows the bad apples for any followers, any country, any race, it gives the perception that the whole of Chicago, the whole of US is full of violence. Yes, there is violence, but they are wonderful people, 99% of the people, right? Peace loving, we all have concern for our families and society. So the very first reason we are having this open house is our fellow Americans, people of other faiths, our brothers and sisters of other faiths, opportunity for them to come to the mosque and meet the Muslims. So when we meet the Muslims and people of other faiths, many barriers that we have, like the fear of the unknowns, they will go away. The second reason we are having the open house is people have so many misconceptions about each other, especially the faith of Islam. You know, thanks to the media, the Fox News, right? <laughs> people only show the wrong side or the bad apples. So it gives the perception that, you know, Islam is something to be feared. But we want to show and we want to say, that Islam is a blessing and not a threat to the society. And the third and important reason we are here is that based upon the commonalities that we have, we can build the bridges as we say, right? Building bridges, we can make better communities and better humanity. I hope all of you agree with that. Yes, wonderful, wonderful. So we have a short presentation about the faith of Islam, about the Muslim culture and about the Muslim presence in the USA then I want to have all of you ask as many questions as possible. Right? It's better to ask questions here than go to Mr. Google and ask the questions, right? <laughs> Just whatever question that you have, we would not be offended at all. Before I start my presentation usually, I want to check your Islamic IQ, right? Especially the guests who are here. Are you guys ready for it? Yeah? And nobody looks at their smartphone for the answers, <laughs> right? <laughs> all right. So here is the very first question for you guys. What is the name of God in the Arabic language? And you have five choices, but the raise of hand, our guest. What would you guess? But the raise of hand. Yes, ma'am. Is that your final answer? Yeah? All right, Laura, you got it. She got it. That's the answer, yes. And the reason I have that question as the number one in the very first question is that people think they have the perception that when we Muslims, when we say that we worship Allah, they think that we are worshiping a different God. But we want to show that Allah is the name of God in Arabic, just like you have the names of God in different languages, the same creator, but different names. Like in Hebrew, you have, you know, Jehovah, Elohim. In uh, Spanish, you have Dios, right? In French, you have Dio. In, uh, Aramaic, 
you have ilah which was the language of jesus at the end of the day one creator in different languages muslims are not worshiping a different god we all have the same one creator all right which one is not a prophet of islam mentioned in the quran our guest over here which one would you guess bahullah okay yolanda you got the right answer very good yes was that a guess elimination <laughs> elimination right <laughs> must be you're really good in taking test <laughs> right <laughs> very good so all the rest of the prophets and many more prophets they are mentioned in the quran with uh, honor and respect and love and admiration so we as you see d we do take jesus to be as a mighty prophet mighty messenger abraham and the rest of the prophets and the messengers Okay, only lady mentioned by name in the Quran. So the Quran has names of many prophets, many messengers, many people. But of all the individuals, there's only one lady whose name is mentioned in the Quran. Can you guess by elimination? Okay, <laughs> which one would you say? Mary. Mary. All right, you're two for two. Yolanda, you're doing good. <laughs> Surprise, right? Of all the ladies, the only lady mentioned by name in the whole Quran is none other. Mary the mother of Jesus You know I was having a conversation in the plane and the next to me there were two catholic ladies and we were just having a good friendly conversation about Islam Catholicism Christianity and I asked them the question exactly the same question and they knew the answer right they said oh we know the answer and they said Mary then I asked them the follow up question okay how many times do you think she is mentioned in the whole Quran they didn't knew the answer right so i said you know the answer <laughs> so no so i mentioned to them 34 times they were surprised then i asked them this question okay how many times do you think she is mentioned in your bible right in chapter 3 of the quran verse number 42 right how about you elanda you know the answer 18 times So then I joked with them and I said we Muslims love her more than you do right <laughs> and they all laughed up there right in the plane <laughs> and the angel is saying to Mary that God has chosen you God has purified you and God has chosen you above all the women so that distinction that honor that prestige as the number one lady of all the ladies in the whole humanity was given to Mary the mother of Jesus that honor is not given to that degree in the quran to the mother of muhammad peace be upon him or his wife or his daughter right or none of the believing ladies a lady who he never saw never met she came like 600 years before him she is the one mentioned in the quran that many times the only lady mentioned with that much honor so we say that's an indication the quran is not coming from the mind of muhammad peace be upon him we say it's coming from god and the prophet was just sharing the message all right i think i have one more question jesus is considered in islam as a what okay our guest over here okay yes all right elimination guest <laughs> go ahead all right you got it laura you guys man all of you are getting with the right answers yes we take him to be as a mighty prophet In fact it says in the Quran chapter 5 verse number 75 that Jesus was a prophet he was only a messenger and many messengers passed away before him so we don't take him to be as god son of god uh, yes a great leader also right every prophet was a great leader and the jewish king but he is taken as a prophet in islam so we believe in multiple prophets the very first prophet in islam is none other then adam the very first man and the last prophet the quran considers is prophet muhammad peace be upon all the prophets and all the messengers so later on in the q and a session maybe you can ask me the question okay what else that the quran says about jesus humongous you know amazing things about jesus and moses and mary and all the prophets so this is one of the impacts that islam is having or muslims are having on this great country of USA so you know each year they come up with the names the top names for the baby boys and the baby girls 
And right now, one of the top names of the top 10 names in the USA is none other than the name Muhammad, right? And these are the rest of the 10 names uh, that the baby boys in this country. Also in UK, the same situation. Actually, I think in the UK, it may be the number one name for the baby boys. And all over the world, we say the number one name for the baby boys is none other than the name Muhammad. After Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. The best-selling poet right now as we speak on Amazon is none other than Rumi. So again, I'm showing that the impact that Muslims are having in the USA, we are living here for five centuries. You know, the two buildings that you see up there, which one do you think they are? So this is the skyline of uh, Chicago, right? So any takers, any guests? You guys know those buildings. But which one? Yeah, John Hancock is one building, and the second one is the Willis or the Sears Tower. The reason I'm showing this is because both those buildings, they were the main structural engineer was none other than a Muslim from Bangladesh. So way back, you know, he came in the 50s and 60s, and he is the main person. So the, uh, the landscape of uh, Chicago and Houston and many countries, uh, cities would not be the way it is right now if not for the Muslims and the impact he had on the skyline of all of these wonderful cities. You know, despite all the misconceptions people have about women in Islam, Islam empowered women to such a degree. I was having conversation with the two sisters in the back up there. I was mentioning that Islam gave humongous rights to women and empowered them to such a degree that they are becoming scholars and champions. So one important such lady is none other than Ibtihaj Muhammad. In 2016 Olympics, she was the very first American lady wearing the hijab and winning the medal for, U for USA as Muslim and as American. One other humongous empowerment and the achievement of Muslim ladies is this. The oldest continuous university in the whole world. Which one do you think it is? The oldest continuous university. Yes. Which one? Yes. How come she knows all the answers, Brother Amir, right? <laughs> you are reading my mind or you have seen my slides or you have been to my other presentations or watched many videos maybe, right? I forgot the name, but it's in Fez. Yeah, Fez. Morocco and the name of the university is Kharawain and this was made in the year 859 but the amazing thing is this it was made by a Muslim lady you know despite the misconceptions people may have about Muslim ladies they don't have a voice identity and just staying at home Islam empowered them to such a degree that when our ladies in this country when we were fighting for right to vote and right to keep the last name right to get education, right to own property. Muslim ladies, 7th, 8th, ninth centuries, they were constructing universities, they were champions and scholars and making pharmacies and hospitals. So that's the empowerment that Islam has given to Muslim ladies. Yes, I do understand that because of some cultures and some countries, some countries they may have taken away those rights that Islam has given to women. So we should never ever judge any faith but the cultural practices and the bad apples of followers of any faith. I was conversing with the wonderful ladies in the back and I was showing to them, I as a Muslim, I would never want to judge Christianity based upon the Spanish Inquisition, the Crusaders, right? And uh, the Christian majority countries in which there is violence and whatnot, I would never judge the Bible or Christianity or the Christian people as a whole for the bad apples that we have. In the same way, no one should judge the wonderful, peaceful, perfect guidance of Islam by the cultural practices of fallible Muslims. All right, uh, so quickly then we will end with this, then we will have uh, as many Q&A as possible. So these are some of the fundamental tenets of Islam. As I mentioned, there are different names for the same creator in different languages, in Sanskrit, Norwegian, Spanish, right, Arabic, different names, but same creator. So these are some of the attributes that we say of that one God. 
we say he is uh, all powerful, independent, merciful, loving, uh, eternal, independent, all of these wonderful attributes. So we say that one of the important attributes of God or Allah in the Arabic language in the Quran is the attribute that he is all loving. So it says in there that for the love of humanity, to guide humanity, Allah chose from the humans, messengers and prophets. So as you can see, these are some of the messengers and prophets which are mentioned in the Quran and that's one of the commonalities that we have with our fellow Christians and the Jewish faith and people of other faiths. So all the prophets and the messengers we say, they came to preach the absolute oneness of God. That humanity should not worship humans and idols and uh, plants, the trees, the animals, but we should all worship and submit to the one creator. So the next quiz question I have for all of you is this. What do you think is the one name in the Arabic for submission to the one creator? Well, it's there on the screen, sorry. I should have hidden that, right? What do you think it is? Islam, right? Yes. So if you ask my third grader, okay, Yusuf, what do you think Islam is? He would say, you know, Abuji, Dad, Islam means that you're worshipping one God. You're submitting to one God. So it says in the Quran, chapter 16, verse number 36, that every prophet, every messenger, they were sent to many, many countries of the past. And their message was to invite humanity to one God. So then we have the question, okay, then how come there are so many faiths? So what it says is that, people when they deviated from the absolute oneness of God, they started to worship idols and that's how a faith was created. Some people they started to worship the sun and the moon, some people started to worship ancestors and the animals. So different faiths were created by different humans. So God, Allah, He sent or appointed prophet after prophet to bring the people back again to the one faith that God has sent to humanity, which is submission to one God. So in that way we say all the prophets were sent, including the last prophet, Muhammad, peace be upon him. Now this slide which I am showing you, this is so amazing. The reason is that you can see the Biblical Old Testament English names and the Arabic names which are mentioned in the Quran for the same prophets. As you can see, Jacob is Yaqub, Joseph is Yusuf, which is name of one of my sons. My other son, his name is uh, Ibrahim for Abraham, right? And the rest of the prophets and the messengers. So brother Amir here is one of the amazing things of the prophets. Listen to this, right? The amazing thing is this. Muslims, we love and admire and respect all the prophets and all the messengers to such a degree that there are more Muslims with the names of the Jewish prophets than all the Jews of the world combined, right? Ain't that amazing, right? So that shows the love, the admiration and the honor that we give to them. So these are some of the funda fundamental beliefs in Islam. And you guys can see the commonalities that we have. The very first belief is to believe in the absolute oneness of God. Secondly is to believe in the angels that God has appointed. And the third one is to believe in all the prophets. So which one did I mention was the very first prophet of Islam? Adam, right? And the last prophet that we believe is who? Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So we say that the last prophet, peace be upon him, that he was appointed as a universal prophet for all the people and all of time. The fourth important belief, and here again is some uh, amazing point, that we take the last scripture that God has given to humanity. You know, one time I saw a billboard in South Africa put up by the Muslims. And the billboard says, okay, you have the Old Testament and the New Testament, now read the last testament, all right? And then they say, Quran, guidance for humanity, all right? So we say that the Quran is the last and the final revelation that God has given, not only to the Arabs and the Indian, Pakistani, Bangladeshi or Muslims, we say that the Quran came for all of humanity. So today I think we have a gift bag, right, Brother Amir, for every single person. So in here, would be a copy of the translation of the Quran. So Sister Shirley, uh, which, uh, in which language do you think is the Quran in? English, Spanish, French? <laughs> Arabic, right? Arabic language. 
So if you go to Amazon, it's ten dollars. Come to the mosque, it's zero dollars, right? It's a gift for all of you, right? All right. So make sure that you get the bag or the gift bag. It has a translation of the Quran. It has a brief biography of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and other spiritual goodies for you. All right. Important. How much time do we have, Brother Amir? Two minutes. Twenty. But how much time for Q and A, though? Twenty minutes. Oh, okay. All right, wonderful. Uh, so we believe in all the books that came uh, before the Quran. So before the Quran, we say that Jesus, peace be upon him, he was given a revelation called the Injil. We say that Moses was given a revelation called as the Torah. Uh, David was given a revelation we call as the Zabur, and Abraham was given a revelation. So me as a Muslim, I have to believe in all of those revelations in their original form. But then we say that God sent the last and the final revelation, which is the Quran, and then God made the promise that this Quran is going to be protected from any change, any alteration, any addition. So there is a prophecy in the Quran, chapter 15, verse number 9. I will say it in Arabic what the prophecy is. Do you understand Arabic? No? Then I will translate it. So it says in chapter 15, verse number 9, إِنَّ نَحْنُ نَزَّلْنَا الزِّكْرَ وَإِنَّ لَهُ لَا حَافِزُونَ So Allah, God is saying that this Quran is coming from God and He's going to protect it. So protection of the Quran. So the young sisters who were reciting, you know, uh, they were reciting from the memory. If my third grader was here, he will recite like 40 chapters of the Quran, of the 114 chapters, just from the memory, in the Arabic language, the original. So there are no less than 30 million Muslims alive right now, young and old and rich and poor and male and female, different countries, all the countries who can memorize the Quran from there, who can recite the Quran from the memory. So let me ask you this question. How many pages of the Bible have you memorized, right? In the original language, right? It's not easy. But just imagine, one of the miracles of the Qur'an is that even children, they memorize the whole Qur'an. So just a quick uh, estimate, uh, Brother Usman, how many memorizers of the Qur'an in the masjid, right? Approximately, the people who come over here, what would you say? Two, three, five, ten, twelve? Thirty. Thirty! There are thirty people right now in the mosque who have memorized the whole Qur'an from the first page to the last page. And there is a special school, evening and full-time school here, in which our children, the Muslim kids, maybe six, seven, eight years of age and older, they come here and they memorize the whole Quran, right? So that's one of the ways, the amazing fact of the Quran. Second amazing fact of the Quran is that it has 6,000 plus passages, no less than 500 of them speaks about Quran and modern science, the scientific facts, how the universe began like 13.8 billion years ago, the expansion of the universe, the rotation of the heavenly bodies, right, the shape of the earth, how the fetus is uh, developed inside the, inside the mother's womb. You're taking my cookies away from me. Oh, just <laughs> no, I'm just joking. <laughs> more more, okay, thank you. Okay. So that is the Quran. The fifth important belief that we have, I think this is the most, or one of the most important belief, we say that this life of this world is a finite life. Every single person we have to die, but then that's not the end of the existence. God is going to bring us back to life in our body and in our soul. So we believe in the day of resurrection and in the day of judgment. So. We will stand in front of God according to the Quran and every single person would be evaluated by based upon how we live this life. So any school teachers over here? Or prof oh, you are. Okay, what grade do you teach? Grade. Challenging, right? Second grade. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I used to teach Sunday school for about nine years and I can understand, you know, the patience it needs. So at the end of the semester, perhaps you will do the evaluation of all what they have done participation may be attendance and quizzes and assignments and you know so many things and then you will give the grade 
So we say that our grand evaluation would be on the day of judgment in front of God himself. Based upon the, the belief that we held and based upon the deeds that we have done. So it says in the Quran, chapter number 2, verse number 25, if a person has the right belief, only submitting and worshipping to the creator, not associating any partners and then doing good deeds, then God says he will promise those individuals eternal paradise. Islam does believe that there is a hellfire. Uh, you know, just like in the school, if people don't listen to you, don't come to the class, right? Don't complete the assignments. Obviously, there would be consequences. In the same way, there would be consequences if a person rejects God or associate partners with God and worship is the creation instead of the creator. So Islam does believe in the hellfire. But me as a Muslim or the Muslims over here, we cannot say this person is going to hellfire, this person is going to paradise. All we can share with all of you is the criteria that God has given is that having the right belief and then doing good deeds. That then the God's mercy comes into play, right? That's how a person goes to paradise. And the last belief that we have is we believe in the divine decree of God. So let me just end with this. What do you think are the five pillars of Islam? Our guest. You can start with one, then we can help you out, okay? What do you think are the five pillars of Islam? You guys know it. Yes, Yolanda, I'm looking at you. <laughs> All right. Family? No. Take a guess. <laughs> one more guess. All right. Family is very important in Islam. There are so many instructions about family in Islam. But take one more guess. We do this five times a day, every day. All right, we pray, right? And somebody is pointing to that uh, banner up there. So we pray five times a day. We pray five times a day. Uh, the morning prayer is before sunrise, then uh, the early afternoon prayer which is going to happen at 1.30, late afternoon prayer, right after sunset is the fourth one, and the fifth one would be uh, when it becomes dark. A quick footnote about the prayer is that the way that Muslims are praying, all the prophets of the uh, God, they used to pray the same way, facing certain direction, placing their forehead on the ground, Worshipping the one creator without any mediator. Okay, four more pillars to go. Yeah, going to Mecca for the pilgrimage. So once in a lifetime, if the means allow, that Muslim is supposed to go and do the pilgrimage to Mecca. Three more to go. Mashallah, she knows all the answers. <laughs> yes, Ramadan, fasting in the month of Ramadan for about 30 days from dawn to sunset. Again, all the prophets of God, including Jesus and Moses, they all used to fast. In fact, one quick point is, it says in the book of Exodus, when Moses was, when he's uh, in the process of receiving the Ten Commandments and the Revelation, he was in the state of fasting for about 40 days. Okay, two more to go. So you, we went over fasting and pilgrimage and praying five times, two more to go. Yes, donations, right? Obligatory charity, as we say the zakah. So 2.5% of our saved assets each year, we calculate and we give to the less fortunate. But besides the 2.5%, we can give any amount of donation to any person who is needy. All right? One more to go, the most important pillar. Why don't you take a shot? Yes. Any one of you have seen that banner in the, in the back, you know the answer, <laughs> all right? Okay, go ahead, take a guess. What is the very first pillar of Islam? Then we'll end with that. Okay, the Muslims, you guys can help. <laughs> Belief in God and the messenger. So we are supposed to recite the shahada, which is the testimony of faith. That Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa Ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu. That means I bear witness. There is no other God besides one God, Allah, and I bear witness that Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the messenger of Allah. So these are the five important deeds we are supposed to do. But besides the five important uh, pillars, there are other obligations. For example, a Muslim is supposed to be 
a peaceful force, an ambassador of peace in the society. A good Muslim is not just uh, sitting in the mosque and uh, praying five times only and you know, reading the Quran and just be with the family. A good Muslim is supposed to indulge in the society, make the society better, forbid evil from the society, be a, a dynamic force of peace in the society. A good Muslim is supposed to be the best towards their neighbors. Muhammad, peace be upon him, he said, you're not a full believer if you eat your full and your neighbors are hungry. A good Muslim is supposed to watch out their tongue. Muhammad, peace be upon him, he said that uh, say something good or remain silent, right? I would say so many marriages would be saved if people apply that, right? So there are humongous commandments and the do's and the don'ts and the guidance. A good Muslim is supposed to respect, respect the elders, especially our parents and especially our mothers. In fact, the Quran say, uh, Islam says, Muhammad peace be upon him, he said that paradise lies beneath the feet of your mothers. A good Muslim is supposed to even take care of the environment. You know, Islam is a green faith, as we say. And I would really appreciate uh, Dr. Madiha for setting up the table. She's so much big into, you know, holistic uh, medicine and holistic living and healthy living and healthy eating. Uh, so that's important, uh, you know, booth that you guys have not been there. Consult with her. Excellent books and excellent setup over here. So at the end of the day, Islam came as a guidance for all of humanity to transform a person, to be a better uh, family member, a better neighbor, and a better human. Islam came to transform the society. So we as brothers and sisters, we can form wholesome societies. So let me end, Brother Amir, with this passage from the Quran. This is in chapter 49 of the Quran, verse number 13. 49, verse number 13. Our Creator addressing all of humanity, He's saying, and the translation is this, that, O oh mankind, O oh humanity, I have created you from one single male and one single female and made you into nations and peoples and tribes that you get to know each other. Not that you may hate and despise and discriminate with each other. God is saying, I created you into different ways and peoples and tribes. You get to know each other. And then God says that the best amongst you is the one who is a well-mannered, God-fearing, pious person. So I hope and pray that all of us here together as brothers and sisters, based upon the commonality, based upon the guidance of God, we work together for better societies. May God help us. May God keep on guiding us. May God bless us. Thank you very much for coming today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sabil, as always, for this wonderful Islam 101. So with that, we will have uh, an open Q&A. Uh, we'll have a call to prayer uh, in about 10 minutes. And at 1.30, we'll actually have a five-minute prayer session, which is going to be the second prayer of the day. And that, that's going to be held in the prayer hall, kind of exiting out these doors to the back. We do have chairs that are set up in the prayer hall, but due to the sanctity of the hall, we ask that uh, those of us who are uh, kind of fully dressed, uh, we can wear shoes inside, it's kind of a sacred area, um, so you know, you're welcome to observe the prayer. Um, otherwise, we will be here as long as you want us to be here to answer any questions, no question is off the chart. Feel free to ask away. That's kind of one of the main reasons we have these sessions uh, to clear away misconceptions. And especially, you know, those of us who are neighbors, who live here, we want you to know who we are. You know, we want you to know what the mosque does, you know, what the prayer sessions are like. And uh, especially I, I uh, met one of you who used to come here when this was a church. So I think, uh, one, one of uh, one of our guests who are sitting in the back were telling me about that. Um, Brother Carl, everyone give Brother Carl a big, big, huge round of applause. Brother Carl, please stand up. So Brother Carl is one of our brothers who um, happened to walk into our mosque off of the highway 
And uh, he happened to just kind of, he was driving by and he was very curious to know what was going on, what, what's this green dome and what's the structure. And he found out that this is a mosque and he was kind of researching different religions, right? And what I'll do is I'll hold off and let me have him come up and share his story with us. It's very inspiring. If I'm totally putting him on the spot because this was not part of the agenda. Um, he called Dr. Sabil up, he spoke to him, and then he came here. So if you're comfortable, I'll give you like just a quick minute so you can kind of enlighten us because your story is very, very inspiring. Right? All right, come on. <clears throat> Assalamu alaikum. Wow, thanks. Wow. Um, my testimony is short. I just feel like if you um, caught me off guard with this one, brother. <laughs> you didn't if you search in your heart, if you search in your heart and you um, seek God, I really honestly believe God will find you. And that's what happened with me. Um, I was taking an Uber. I think I was coming back from, I like to travel a lot. I was coming back from one of my trips and the Uber driver happened to be a brother. And, and uh, he told me about um, Islam and he told me about this monster and I got his phone number and then eventually I got in contact with Dr. Brother right there. And I came here and um, it's just been a wonderful journey. And I'm just going to leave on this note, just, if you don't do nothing else today, seek God, especially in this time that we live in right now, seek God, and I guarantee he will find you. Thank you. <laughs> Here, brother. Thank you, brother. You know, that's the best advice. See, God, you know, we all want to make sure that we please the creator the way that he wants us to please him. All right, here is the time for all of you. Any question that you have for your heart's content, go for it, please. And we will give our guests the very first chance to ask any question. Some of the things which I mentioned and some things that uh, you know, I left out purposely, so I want to hear from you so we can discuss that topic. Go for it. Yes. Two questions. I, I know you have believed in the day of last judgment. Do you believe in purgatory? Okay, so the question is, uh, do we believe in the purgatory? Not the way that our Catholic friends they believe in. What we say is that uh, after everyone dies, or after we die, uh, we would be in a different dimension called as the bar barza. And our souls would be there, and later on, when uh, God is going to bring us back to life, so our body would be reconstructed back, and our souls would be placed back into the body, and then there would be the day of judgment. So that is the process that is going to happen in a nutshell, in a brief way. Then after the day of judgment for how long? Then uh, by God's mercy, those people who fulfill the criteria of having the right belief in doing good deeds, they would be placed into paradise and then the consequences for those who rebelled against God. Good question. So, yes, ma'am. What is something that you wish your teachers knew when you went to school, for anybody in here too? Oh, wonderful. Uh, what would be some things that the teachers can know about Muslims, Islam, how to accommodate? You know, it's very important that uh, in our school systems, there are so many kids from different backgrounds and races and cultures and whatnot. Uh, many a times, if a teacher does not know where the person is coming from, uh, they may not be properly accommodated. So it's important to know some of the needs of uh, all the students, but especially in the context of uh, where we are, the, the Muslim students. For example, a Muslim student, uh, when they are fasting for 30 days, it's important not to be, not for them to be placed in the lunchroom, right? It will be too tempting for them, people are eating. So to give them certain other assignment. Uh, also, when it comes to prayer times, many schools are accommodating the Muslim students. Uh, they can go and pray, like quick five minute prayer. Uh, Muslims, uh, since some ladies, some girls, they wear the hijab, good to accommodate. Many parents, they will not feel comfortable in having co-ed swimming classes, dancing and music classes. So knowing that, those uh, concerns of the parents, important for the teachers. Also really important, 
many of, of the people of color, and especially Muslims, based upon what the media is showing, so they could be bullied in the classrooms. So the teacher should be keeping an eye on that. And also, in the times of some uh, special days of the Muslims, maybe the Muslim students, as a classmates, they can educate the other students about their culture, their background. So in that way, the fear of the unknown of people may have about each other, so they may go away, and then uh, once they know that they are accommodated better, they can become better students and more focused students. So that's kind of the minimal things that we can do. Yeah. So as I mentioned, we pray five times a day. Before each prayer, there is a call for prayer. So whether Amir or someone is going to make the call for prayer in Arabic, and I will do the Allah. quick translation of it. Yeah. Allah is great, Allah is great. Allah is great, Allah is great. I bear witness, no other God besides one God, Allah. I bear witness, there's no other God besides one God, Allah. I bear witness that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. I bear witness that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. Come to prayer. Come to prayer. Come to your success. Come to your success. Allah is great, Allah is great. There is no other God besides one God, Allah. So after the call for prayer, we recite a small supplication uh, to send peace and blessings on Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So some of you who have been, anyone to a, been to a Muslim country, like Muslim majority country, right? So you may see and you may hear this call of prayer is done up from outside with the outside speakers. So the concept is that people here in the community that the prayer is about to start, anything that they're doing, they should uh, wrap up, they should get ready so they can come to the mosque and they can do that prayer. So that's the concept to remind the community. But nowadays, I mean, especially in the USA, because of the zoning laws, we cannot do the call for prayer outside. So just imagine 4 a.m. in the morning in the bowling brook, right? If you see like Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, right? In the whole community, people will be surprised. They'll be thinking, come on, we want to sleep. So because of the zoning laws, not, we cannot do it here. But in Muslim countries, it's very common. So I was born and raised in India. So we can hear it so many thousands of mosques having the call for prayer. Okay, we have still some time for some Q&A. Go ahead. So at approximately 1.25, we will head out to the mosque area and uh, watch the prayer. And then you're all welcome to come back to ask more questions. So someone was raising their hand. Yes, ma'am. Why do women have to be covered? Okay, so the question is, uh, why do women have to be covered? Uh, first and foremost reason is this, that it is a commandment coming from God. It's an instruction coming from God. But let me mention this from a human psychology. You know, dress code, we are all used to dress codes. There is a dress code in the church, in the mosque. There's a dress code in schools and colleges. There's a dress code when you go to a restaurant. So we say the covering is a covering, the dress code of modesty. 
And this is mentioned in the Quran, chapter 33, verse number uh, 59, and chapter 24, verse number 31. But the dress code in Islam or the concept of modesty is not only for the females, also for the males like me and other Muslim brothers over here, we also have to cover modestly. We cannot wear tight clothes, transparent clothes. We also have to wear uh, modest clothes. Women, they just have to cover more because that's what Allah mentioned, because they're more beautiful. <laughs> so they have to cover more. But the concept of modesty is there in every culture in every city, every constitution. Even in this country, there are nine states in which women have to cover more compared to the males. Means, for example, a male can go out in the street in those uh, states, you know, topless. They would not be arrested. If a lady goes out topless in those states, she would be arrested. So there is a disparity based upon human psychology and, and, uh, and just the human decency. Modesty and the covering is also there in the Jewish and also in the Christian faith. For example, in the Jewish faith, a, Mus a Jewish lady, once they get married, they cannot show their hair. Means they have to properly cover. Even in the Christian faith, you know, those from the uh, Catholic faith, you may realize that uh, the nuns, they cover themselves. Mary, the mother of Jesus, she used to be properly, as a symbol of modesty, she, she used to cover. Even in the Bible it says, in the New Testament, in the 1st Corinthians, chapter 11, verse number 5 and 6, that Christian ladies, when they specially go to the church, they cannot show their hair. They have to properly cover. So the covering is both in culture, in history, in the scriptures, in the human psychology. So Islam is really big on modesty. But modesty is not limited only to what we wear. Islam is big upon modesty, modesty of the eyes, for example. Quran says in chapter 24, verse number 30, speaking to the Muslim males, the Quran says that, O oh, believing males, lower your gaze and guard your modesty. It is better for you in the eyes of God. Same thing is mentioned to the women. So modesty of our eyes, our physical uh, interaction between males and females, modesty of what we wear, modesty of what we hear, our tongue, it's a holistic concept, so humanity could be chaste and decent and modest, so we can judge each other, not based upon our bodies and how we look, but by our intellect, by the blessings, the talents that God has given to us. So that is the bigger, higher concept of modesty and covering in Islam. Any follow-up question or? Oh, thank you. <laughs> Okay, so what we can do? Yes, a question from the sister. Um, why are men separated from women in the mosque? Okay, fine. So the question is this. Why are men and women, uh, when they pray, why are they pray separately? Uh, so Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in his mosque, uh, there used to be segregation. Men used to pray in the front, women in the back, right? So we are following his tradition. But that's not unique only to the mosque. Even if you go to a Jewish uh, Orthodox synagogue, you will have separation, segregation. Even if you go to a Greek Orthodox church, you will have segregation. So the scholars, what they say is segregation or separation, uh, it is based upon uh, you know, a place of worship. See, our focus should only be to God. Suppose, I mean, so Muslims when we pray, we stand shoulder to shoulder, literally touching each other when we pray. I mean, not in COVID, but usually when we pray, right? So it will not be modest and decent if I'm praying and next to me is a lady praying, touching me. Sometimes human psychology, human bi biology, my focus can be on her compared to it should be up there, right? Same thing may happen to a lady if a man is standing, touching her, an unknown, a stranger. I mean, I have a daughter, I would not be comfortable if a man, unknown, somebody, standing next to her, touching her. Plus the way that we pray, we uh, stand up, we bow down, we prostrate, it will not be decent and chaste if a men are praying here, women in the front, and they're bowing down, they are prostrating, it will not be decent. So praying segregation means women would be more comfortable, focus would be up there, and at the end of the day, both prayers are accepted. It doesn't matter if somebody is praying on the side, on the back, on the balcony. 
uh, Allah is going to accept the prayers of both males and females. So for that reason, we have segregation and separation. You understand, Sister Sandy? Wonderful. Okay, so what we can do is, let's head out and we can follow the ladies in the ladies section and the men's in the men's section. We will pray there and you guys are welcome to come back and ask any question that you have. So again, may God guide and bless all of you. Thanks a lot for coming.